Uh, this is essentially a story how we try to learn how to use learning and verification. Um, so uh, what is the setup? Uh, so the setup is we want to control systems uh, that have maybe some probabilistic behavior. There are some degrees of freedom. And we want to control them in some optimal way. Or we want to ensure that no matter what happens, they work properly. Uh, so this is something that formal methods, verification and synthesis can do for us. Uh, but we still struggle. We still struggle a lot uh, when it comes to real systems that uh, are large, complex, and uh, when we want to really uh, make it work in practice and make it used by the engineers. Why is that? Well, then let me zoom in a bit uh, to the formal methods that uh, provide us with uh, this fascinating technology. Uh, so here is our hero who can synthesize uh, uh, strategies. So to keep the tool anonymous, let's just call it synthesizer. Uh, so our hero uh, is very capable of uh, synthesizing uh, strategies that are optimal, so synthesizing controllers of robots that behave in the best possible way or uh, guaranteeing that uh, no matter what, then the probability of uh, uh, a plane, uh, fatal error in a plane is 10 to minus 9. Uh, but uh, it has some scalability issues, uh, definitely. Uh, so uh, it's a push-button technology. So what happens if you push the button? Uh, well, you get a memo out, for instance. Then uh, you work hard, and uh, you pu push the button again, and you get a timeout. Uh, then you work hard again, and then uh, maybe in the end uh, you get this, which is, uh, which is uh, say, uh, some description of how to control your robot. And then the engineer tells you, ah, uh, I don't like this. I'm not going to use it anyway. I don't understand it. I mean, I, if I want to change something here, I mean, I, I don't know what, what, is going, what is going on here. How can I maintain this? How can I adapt this? How can I trust this? I mean, you say you have a proof that this works. But I don't know what it's doing. I don't trust this. And uh, so this is something that, uh, uh, that uh, we should try, uh, try and change. Um, and uh, there is a good opportunity to... Uh, there's good opportunity to uh, actually utilize, sorry, to utilize uh, what learning can do for us. Okay, so learning stands somehow on the other side of the spectrum, where uh, the results provided by by a learning community are rarely to be really trusted. Okay, all the best that you can hope for is probably approximately correct, which is something that is perfectly fine for many people. And I mean, when I'm uh, when uh, uh, my spam is classified, I'm, I'm totally happy to be uh, to be uh, to be a victim of, of misclassification from time to time. That's okay. Uh, in the safety uh, critical setting, this is uh, less acceptable. Uh, but we should not ignore it uh, because what they can give us is, uh, and when I say they, I mean uh, machine learning people, uh, they can give us is uh, techniques that are extremely known for uh, their scalability. I mean, what, what uh, I mean, it, uh, made it into the news. I mean, everyone is amazed what, uh, what, uh, what they can do now. Uh, so we should really uh, take this into account. And something that is not maybe uh, so uh, well, well known is, uh, at least not publicly, uh, everyone here knows, uh, is the ability to prefer simpler solutions. OK, so this is something that is uh, not uh, so important by itself, maybe for the machine learning people, because what they want is to achieve good classification. Okay, so there is this regularization, and we have heard a lot about this uh, already today. And so then, a simpler solution is more likely to be uh, the one that generalizes better. This is not our aim. We don't need to generalize better. Uh, we need uh, something entirely different. Okay, but this ability to use simpler solution is something that we want to use. And I will illustrate this uh, in, in the course of the talk. Uh, so there is a, there is a, there is a slight problem. Uh, the machine learning techniques typically focus on entirely different objectives than uh, people in verification are. Uh, well, this is something that we can, I mean, we can uh, work on this. We can adjust the techniques. And in principle, then, in the end, we can obtain a whole spectrum of technologies where we can trade off maybe precision for scalability and simplicity. Uh, and this is to something that to some extent has been happening recently, I would say recent two, two years. But this is actually not what I want to do. I would like to do uh, more. I would like to intertwine the two 
so that we get the boast of the two worlds. So I don't want to sacrifice the, the, the guarantees on the result. But at the same time, I would like to get uh, scalability and simplicity. Okay, so I'm very greedy, so let's see if, uh, if I can get anything uh, with this approach. Uh, the general idea of the approach is that, uh, and uh, let me try again if this, no, uh, okay. Uh, so the general idea is that what formal methods can provide us with is a very precise and reliable computation that provides maybe more precise data than the learner usually has in the standard machine learning setting. And then uh, the learning guys can provide us with more, I would say, understanding of the problem than we can automatically get. Uh, the point is that most of the time we are, in formal methods, we are spending our computation effort on computing very precisely something that we don't need at all. And or that plays only a marginal, marginal role uh, for, for the final result. And uh, so the idea is that uh, this uh, learning part provides us with some insights and provides us <coughs> with some understanding and gives us a, a better focus on what, what to compute. And here we do the computation and give uh, a lot of information to the learner who can refine this. And I will illustrate this concept uh, in two different settings. Uh, one of the settings is the usage of reinforcement learning uh, when we want to uh, create these strategies. Okay, so we're given a problem. I uh, want to control a robot so that it doesn't fall off the cliff. Uh, it's serving some area and it's going, it's doing it in the cheapest way. Then uh, uh, so this is something that uh, would be would be solved by reinforcement learning uh, also in uh, in. Uh, in, in other communities, uh, but we want guarantees on that. We want guarant hard guarantees on safety, and maybe we don't even want to have uh, hard guarantees on the performance and so on. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is one area, and we actually worked on uh, different models. Uh, for this talk, I will only focus on uh, the Markov decision processes, and I will, I will, uh, I will uh, say more about this on the next slide. The other area where I will want to illustrate uh, what we, what we uh, learned about learning is uh, the use of machine learning structures to represent the results of our work in a more understandable way, okay? And uh, this will, in, in, namely, this is, uh, we represent strategies instead of as big pictures that no one understands or four gigabytes of data describing what to do in every possible situation. We would like to draw a picture that actually people who are working as, uh, I mean, say people who repair your car are using on a daily basis, okay? So something that is really understandable uh, for the engineers uh, and uh, so something that they would, uh, they would accept. Uh, and I'm, in this talk, I'm going to entirely focus on Markov decision processes and uh, the simplest objective of reachability. So what is that? So here we have an example of a Markov decision process. So I'm really sorry I cannot, oh, I now can. Uh, uh, this is very interesting. Um, so I should uh, use the opportunity while it still works. So what we have here is an uh, automata style uh, picture where there is an initial state uh, over here and we have now uh, two actions that we can take. We can either go up or we can go down. So if we choose to go down, then with 1% chance, we end up in S, and with 99%, we end up in T. Uh, if we end up in S, we can choose from A and B, and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, what are, these, uh, what are these clouds over here? Uh, these are just billions of other states that I was too lazy to uh, draw and uh, unable to fit into the picture. Uh, the point is, uh, these may be very complicated parts of the system and very long. Uh, now, so this is, uh, this, is, uh, the, um, this is the behavior of the system. So we choose an action and with pro a certain probability you end up uh, in a, uh, each of the successors. Now, the goal here, uh, the simplest goal uh, that is useful in verification is the reachability goal. Uh, and many others that uh, you use in verification can be reduced to this one uh, with uh, more or less effort. So this is why I'm focusing on this one. Uh, so what is the what is the goal here? We want to get uh, 
We want to maximize the chance to reach this goal. And so we not only want to compute the probability uh, that un uh, while using this strategy we reach the goal, but we also want to get the strategy in a readable manner. Uh, so what would be an optimal strategy? How would it behave? Well, here we have one. So uh, it's uh, if you went up, then uh, there is no arrow from here to the goal, so it apparently wouldn't be a good idea. So the better idea is actually to go down. That's not so surprising then. And if you end up in T, then uh, you already have a guarantee of uh, ending up in the goal, very good. If you go to S, then uh, yeah, you still have to have a chance to, to, uh, to reach the goal with, uh, with one half. And with the other half, you end up in the other cloud where, uh, where you cannot do anything anymore. Okay, so this is, uh, this is one possible uh, optimal behavior, okay? Here is another one, okay? Spot the difference. So it's entirely different. It differs in billions of decisions. Actually, maybe there are like four decisions that are the same. The rest is entirely di uh, the rest is oops sorry. So the rest is entirely different. Okay. Unfortunately, the differences are completely irrelevant. You're not interested in them. Okay. So now you could say, okay, well, these states cannot even reach the goal. So why do I have to be interested in those? Can I cannot I just pre-process and say, oh, I'm not interested in these, and then work on the rest? Of course, this is something that is happening. Uh, but once I put an arrow over here, then you cannot get rid of the cloud, okay? Or if you do so, then you don't know what, what, uh, how much imprecision this will, uh, this will uh, incur. Uh, but if you look at it more closely, then no matter what you do in the cloud, what is uh, the, po uh, the highest possible uh, uh, effect on the result? Well, the probability to get actually to this cloud at all, okay, it stopped working again. Uh, so the probability to get to this cloud at all is half a percent, okay? So even if you totally screw up, then uh, uh, you may have lost half a percent, uh, and, uh, but not more. Okay, so if you are interested in getting, uh, say, a strategy that is optimal and the precision, required precision is, say, 1%, then you can totally ignore what is happening in here. And, of course, also uh, in the upper cloud. Uh, okay, similarly, if maybe your, uh, well, I said 1%, so, I mean, if indeed your precision, required precision is just 1%, then you may as well forget about B because uh, what you're, uh, to, uh, the, the probability that you actually end up in S is at most 1%. So uh, no matter what you do there, it's not going to affect the result with more than 1%. So in the end, the whole strategy, what to do, boils down to saying, pick down. Okay, so you can uh, draw it uh, using a, a kind of a degenerate decision tree, which asks, is the action that you want to play down? If yes, that's a good idea. If no, it's a bad idea. Okay, and that's, uh, that's what you would like to get. So let me now guide you through how we actually do these two steps. How do we ignore all those millions of states that are not important? And how do we distill the information uh, to uh, its core that we can then present to the user? So the first phase is to compute the, compute the strategy, okay? So first, uh, it is wise to look at uh, what is the standard approach to compute them. So here I am displaying uh, the, the core of one of the standard algorithms uh, called value iteration. It's uh, not terribly important. Um, what is the principle of this algorithm? Uh, well, imagine that uh, you are computing, uh, so you, you want to compute for the moment the probability, the maximal probability to reach the state, okay? So forget about the strategy for the, for the moment, let's just compute the number, okay? So if you're computing, say, a lower and upper bound on this number, then uh, you try to do some work in the middle, you do some work, until the lower and upper bound in the initial state, which is the number that you want to compute, is so close that you basically know uh, what the number is and uh, or you, you know the imprecision, okay? Now, what is the work that you have to do? Uh, so uh, for those of you who, who, who 
don't know this. Uh, this is these are just standard Bellman equations, and we're computing uh, uh, we're computing uh, fixed points of, of this set of equations. Basically, what is intuitively happening here is we are processing all the transitions that are in the system. So for all the transitions, we are doing some computations with them, basically propagating the information throughout the system. Okay, uh, it's not terribly important uh, how uh, how they exactly uh, how they exactly look, uh, but uh, the the idea is that of course, if you want to say what is a value of an action, well, what is the probability that you will get to the target using action A? Well, it is the some of the probabilities that you will get there from the successors, okay, weighted by the transition probability. What is the value of a state? Well, it is the uh, value of the maximal action. So you pick the best action, okay? Nothing, nothing more than that. Okay, so this is all very nice. Uh, and uh, so there are a couple of issues that I'm uh, hiding under the rug. Uh, but uh, the major uh, issue here that I want to highlight is uh, actually this... Uh, for all, okay? So we don't know anything about the system and the only guarantees uh, that, uh, that uh, are acceptable is that uh, we definitely want to get our, our result. So we cannot forget about any of the transitions, okay? So what we do, we update all the transitions. Now, this raises a question. Shouldn't I be rather first looking at those transitions that actually affect my result and not worry too much about those that are not important. So in this picture, I rather should look at things that are happening over here and not think too much about those at the moment. Okay? How do I do that? Well, I don't know anything about the system. So if I knew, then uh, that would be great. But I don't. Uh, so for the moment, let's now imagine a simpler task. Say you don't have a Markov decision process where there are probabilities and non-deterministic decisions, but you just have a Markov chain. Okay, so there is only probabilities. The same algorithm applies. Now, uh, what you can do is to look at those transitions that are visited more frequently, that are used more frequently, and therefore their effect will be higher. Okay, so if I uh, simulate and I'm always taking the, these kind of paths, so I really want to know what is happening in this part of the system. And maybe there are parts of the system that I can reach with probability 10 to minus 15, and there I'm not really interested that much. Okay, so what you could do is you could just say, okay, I sample a path from the initial state, and this gives me, uh, uh, this gives me, uh, this gives me some data on what are the transitions that seem to be important, seem to be frequently visited. And I do that again and again and again, and I'm not really doing it exactly like uh, that I would compute how, how important is each of the transitions. I'm just doing it uh, as a heuristic. I have no guarantee that I'm really doing it precisely, but that doesn't really matter. The point is that if I do it long enough, then I update all the transitions anyway. Because if I simulate long enough, then I will use all the transitions that are uh, usable in the system, okay? It's just that I want to prefer those that uh, seem to be frequently used. And uh, I don't have to be worried about uh, the fact that I am postponing the processing of some transitions, uh, because I always know what is the current uh, imprecision that I have because I compute both the upper and lower bound. I will uh, I will comment on this uh, uh, later on in more detail. Now, so this was uh, Markov chains. I mean, you could you could just do basically this, and it would work. But now, what about Markov decision processes? So uh, when you want to when you want to simulate a Markov decision process, you have to do some uh, decisions. You have to resolve the non-determinism. Okay, what people in industry do when they analyze they, their safety critical systems, they just uh, randomly pick a decision and they hope that if there is a problem it will show up. Uh, this is not very efficient and uh, furthermore we also want to get uh, guarantees on, uh, on optimality. So uh, this is not what we're going to do. What we would like to do is actually look at actions that are taken by reasonably good schedulers. 
Okay, those that actually go into the important parts of the state space where we can reach the target. But hang on, this is exactly what we're trying to compute, right? We're trying to compute the optimal one. And I would like to use the actions that the optimal one uses, but I don't know what it is. Okay, so where do I get them? Well, and this is where the machine learning kicks in. <coughs> so uh, the reinforcement learning, which uh, long story short is uh, based on the rule, try something and if it doesn't work out too well, next time try something else. Uh, and uh, a, what reinforcement learning can do is to give us a guesses of schedulers, oh, sorry, I say schedulers because this is uh, used in, in, in those communities, but equivalently this is uh, called strategy. Uh, so what reinforcement learning can do is it can give us reasonable strategies in many cases, okay? No guarantees, uh, but uh, it, it's not too expensive. So what we can do is we can start running uh, some schedules that are suggested by the learner and take this for the moment as those actions that seem to be important. Uh, and later on, when we know more about the system and know more about the schedule because we know more about uh, the, the upper and lower bounds, we tell this information to the learner and he can process it in uh, more detail and give us a better guess. So how does this work? In practically or technically, uh, uh, what we do is, and this is what uh, actually, so there are, if you look at the pack uh, learning of MDPs, then uh, the, the classical algorithm, what it does, it basically picks the one that has currently the highest upper bound. So what is that? That is currently the most promising action. Okay, not too surprising. Uh, well, actually it wouldn't work if it were, uh, if it were uh, something else. I mean, it, you would have a hard time to actually uh, get the, the proper guarantees on, on, on runtime and probability that this works and so on. So this is, um, uh, again, hiding a couple of things under the rug. Uh, but the idea is that when you come to a state and you have to make a decision, you pick the decision that currently looks the most promising one, okay? And this way you can generate a path. You update the information on this path and you figure out, mm, actually this is not a, so a good a strategy or so good a path as I, as I thought. Uh, I will lower my upper bounds accordingly and next time I come to the state, I decide in a different way, okay? So this way, there is actually a tight communication between uh, the value iteration part where we do the precise computation and the guy who guesses what is a uh, roughly good schedule, a roughly good strategy. So on the one hand, we provide, by doing the precise computation, uh, we provide much more precise updates that are, than are those that are people in reinforcement learning used to because we actually may know our model, we may work with a white box model, whereas they work with uh, a robot moving in an unknown environment, maybe. <laughs> Uh, and uh, on the other hand, we are utilizing information that it would be difficult to get, uh, get by uh, in other means uh, because it's something that is even hard to define. What is important part of the system, okay? And if you want to compute it, then it's harder than the problem that, uh, that we are attacking. So a good uh, heuristic uh, is very handy here. Uh, let me just mention uh, one more thing here, uh, namely that uh, the upper bound actually here that, that, that we compute is important for two reasons. So first, uh, so if you look at uh, the technology five years ago, then people were not computing the upper bound uh, because they were, uh, well, they were just not computing the upper bound. Uh, it is because it was also difficult to do that. Uh, what we want to do here is to compute the upper bound because then once we know what is the lower bound and the upper bound, we can do all kind of crazy stuff that learning can give us, okay? We don't need any guarantees because now we know what we are doing, we know that we are converging, we know how far we are, and we can do all kind of crazy stuff. Uh, at the same time, fortunately, upper bound was exactly the thing that uh, we needed to employ this 
and we didn't need much more, let me say. Okay, so practically, does this work? Well, there are some benchmarks, I mean, standard, just a couple of standard benchmarks from the, from the probabilistic verification area. Uh, so these are the number of states of the MDP. So in principle, if you want to compute an optimal strategy, you have to say in each of the states what, uh, what to do. Here, uh, this is the number of states that we actually need to go through, and uh, need to uh, look at, uh, in order to get a strategy that is slightly imprecise. What is slightly? Well, it's something like 10 to minus 6 relative error. Okay, so this is... Uh, precise enough for any practical reasons, and actually we only had to look at a small fraction of the whole system. Okay, so now we have uh, our huge strategy. Well, it's not uh, necessarily terribly huge. It's uh, now, you see, it can be a bit smaller. Uh, but still, it's large. Now, uh, what is the state of the art in, uh, in processing such, such strategies? Well, typically, you don't do anything. So you output what to do in each of the possible states, in each of the possible configurations of the system. And uh, this is, of course, unusable and not understandable. Okay, so this, is, this doesn't fit into an embedded device. You cannot even implement it because you don't have the resources. Nobody understands it, uh, not to mention like maintenance or, or, or modification. Okay? Now, you may say, okay, uh, Maybe it's because it's too large. What about making it smaller? So what is the usual way of making things smaller in, uh, in formal methods? Well, some symbolic approach, some clever data structures, say binary decision diagrams. Okay, so you can go for BDDs. Well, uh, that may be a good idea uh, to, to some extent. Uh, definitely you get something that is smaller. Uh, unfortunately, BDDs are also quite well known for not being too readable. Uh, so part of the problem remains, and moreover, the size of the BDD is still pretty large. And what we want to go for is decision trees, not only because they are yet smaller, but because they are also uh, more readable. So how do I interpret, I mean, this is, this is actually for, uh, I think this may be the, for, for, the, for the mass rover uh, uh, mutual exclusion arbiter or something like that, where basically uh, this tree tells you is uh, the action that you want to play called, and this is a part of the, of the code, I mean, there is an action called rec. Uh, if yes, that's a bad idea. If no, is this the action? Well, y if yes, then uh, whether it's a good idea or not depends on whether some variable is positive or not, okay? So this is somehow telling you which action to play under what circumstances, okay, in a compact way. Instead of giving you all the millions of situations, you kind of distill that, oh, it actually depends on whether Z is positive or not. And uh, for instance, uh, another, another, another uh, example is uh, where, you where we took uh, some protocol where, where there was a bug injected, and actually the, the tree that, again, like uh, roughly this size, was... Uh, containing, again, one of these nodes where you refer to some particular action, and uh, that was the action that we actually inserted that contained the bug. So it can even serve to localize the, the error. Okay, uh, how do you do that? And why does it work better than, say, BDDs? So the idea is that uh, from here, we know exactly what the strategy is. Okay, so we know about the precise decisions. Now, in order to have a nice and compact representation, we should try to distill the information. First of all, what are the important decisions? And what are the less important decisions? So that we display the more important decisions more clearly. Uh, uh, one could say that, uh, and let me, let me now jump down here. Let me define what I uh, think is a, is a, is a, reasonable, a reasonable definition for an importance of a certain decision uh, with respect to reaching goal under a certain strategy. I think a good idea might be to actually look at the probability that you reach this state. So if you don't reach this state at all or with very low probability, then it's probably not too important what you do there. Okay, agree? Uh, and uh, there is another term here 
basically saying that if you arrive to some state very likely, okay, it's very likely that you arrive to that state, but you cannot reach the goal anymore anyway, no matter what you do, then it's also irrelevant what you do, okay? So this, I mean, you can come up with other definitions. I mean, this is just one that we, we, uh, we chose. I mean, we tried like four different ones and this seemed to be, uh, this seemed to be slightly better, um, but uh, this is not carved in stone. So now that you have this importance, uh, you could say, okay, I will use traditional technology. I will just, first of all, discard all the decisions that have zero importance, okay? So of course, this is perfectly valid, so you throw out the decisions that don't affect the result at all. Then you could say, mm, it's still too large. I mean, my BDD is still too large. What about throwing away all the decisions that have a very low importance? Okay, so this will incur some error, okay? Uh, we could even compute how much, uh, and uh, would result in a more compact representation. That's good, but we are not actually really utilizing uh, the real quantity, the, the, the actual number, okay? It's just like, if it's higher than the threshold, the importance is higher than zero point something, I will try to uh, represent it, otherwise I don't, okay? This is a very naive way of, uh, of, uh, of representing the strategy. Cannot we do something more? And actually it turns out that we can, but we have to use a different data structure. We'll use the decision trees. The point of, uh, the, the, the problem of BDDs is that it behaves as follows. You put some data in and the data is in there. Exactly the data that you put there. Okay, this looks like something that we would like for, from normal data structures, but we don't like it here. Uh, the advantage of decision trees is that it chooses itself which data is actually then contained. So you feed in the data, it learns, and maybe if it thinks, oh, this is too hard for me to learn, screw it, uh, it's fine, okay? Maybe, maybe the error is not going to be high. You have to test this and you can do it precisely, but it is going to pick what is to be learned and what not. And we can stress different decisions with different importance. So those that are important, we will input many times, so this will be, there will be many copies in the training set for, for, for the decision trees, and those that are not important, there will be only a few. And uh, uh, this way, you kind of make the decision tree prefer to remember the important ones, but you do not ha have hard restrictions. If there is like one decision that is like just above the threshold, but it's really hard to, hard to uh, remember, hard to represent, then you just, uh, the decision tree automatically forgets about it and becomes much smaller and the error hopefully doesn't grow too much. And uh, so this is, this is the principle. And as a result, uh, what you can get here is for instance, so let, let me look at for instance, I mean this line. So the original size of the state space was uh, some 35,000. Uh, then the, the actual maximum probability is, I mean, 0 0.95 or whatever that is. Uh, if you look at the explicit representation of the strategy, it's, uh, I mean, some of the states are not reachable under the strategy, so we can forget about them, okay, so it's a bit smaller. If you encode it as a BDD, okay, yes, it's significantly smaller, but actually if you encode it as a decision tree, then uh, you, get, uh, you get something that you can draw on a piece of paper, and the relative error here is less than a percent. Okay, you can do the same, I mean, in, in, in this case. In, in this particular case, for instance, the case, is, the, the situation is that uh, we get a trivial decision tree. What does that mean? Actually, no matter what you do, you end up in the target. Okay, but uh, it's good to know that, right? I mean, before that you had a complicated strategy that was computed, you didn't even realize that uh, you, can, you can do anything. Uh, okay, now what is this strange mem out over here? That's a bit, looks a bit disappointing. Well, if you, it turns out that if you input this into the state of the art tools, then they cannot even produce the strategy because it's too large. But what you can do is you can play the trick from, uh, from the first part of, uh, of the talk, which was to compute only a partial strategy, okay? So forget about the, the clouds, just focus on the important ones. Then it's actually much smaller. And if you draw it uh, as a decision tree, then you can draw it on a piece of paper and actually you can scale it up. I mean, here in this case, we scaled it up to like trillions of states and it still was the same tree because it was just some parameter that was not affecting the behavior terribly much. And uh, so it's good to be able to explain what is happening in such large systems 
on a drawing that, that you can actually look at, or it would fit on the slide. Uh, okay, let me just uh, let me just very briefly mention that, uh, of course, we are not uh, we are not the only ones who are who are working on this. So there are there is uh, there is some uh, recent work on. Uh, and now I'm referring to to, to this paper uh, where. Uh, the reinforcement learning is applied once you compute uh, once you compute uh, safe actions so that your robot doesn't get destroyed. So this is useful in another setting where you actually want to really learn the strategy uh, in the terrain. So you don't really simulate this, but um, I mean you have a real robot and you, you want to uh, want this to behave say, safe all uh, all throughout the learning process. There's also quite a bit of work in verification where, for instance, this one, but there, is, uh, there are many more, where they just apply learning and they give up on guarantees. Okay, from my perspective, this is not very satisfactory because then uh, we're not really verifying much, uh, but uh, it, it may be faster. Uh, and uh, also there are other approaches to represent strategies, for instance, uh, uh, for instance, uh, Daniel is, is, was, was, is work, working on uh, representing them through, through automata. Excellent. Uh, very good. So, uh, and let me also mention that, uh, okay, there are of course other uses which are in some sense uh, same in the philosophy that uh, I presented here and that is like, let's keep the guarantees. So for instance, if you have a theorem prover, then whatever the theorem prover proves is safely proven, but the guidance, which rules to try out first can be given by some learning algorithm. Or if you want to generate an invariant, uh, you can test whether it's an invariant or not, but the, the guess, like what should I try out, that's the hard thing and that's where you can ask the learner and you don't need any guarantees. Any heuristic uh, is helpful. Okay, so to summarize, uh, so what we have seen is two applications or two uses of learning and verification uh, to speed up things or to improve their quality. In one case it was the reinforcement learning, in the other case the decision tree learning. And uh, it was always about identifying something important, getting some insight into the system, something that is hard to formalize and uh, hard to obtain for us using the traditional techniques, uh, but still any good guesses can be utilized and uh, made, uh, uh, made uh, yeah, uh, can be utilized. Uh, for those of you who are interested uh, in, this, in this topic, uh, there is a workshop called Learning and Verification. So the, the second, uh, second issue is going to be uh, this, uh, this April at ETAPS. Uh, so the call for papers is uh, about to be sent out. And uh, let me wrap up with uh, some ideas to, uh, to think about. Uh, so uh, one of the things is, uh, uh, this compromising the, 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 the precision, the guarantees. Maybe I am too rigid here and uh, maybe we actually want to give up a bit. I mean, we don't have to. I mean, we have seen that uh, in what I presented or in the, say, the invariant generation, we don't give up on anything. Uh, but maybe we, uh, we might want to. Maybe we just, I mean, we're definitely usually fine with epsilon optimal controllers for robots when we know the epsilon with the imprecision. Maybe we should be fine with, uh, with arbitrary ones, but I mean, is this then still a verification? Uh, maybe we could be fine with uh, pack guarantees. Maybe in the real life anyway, it's, it's, you cannot really in the end hope for anything more because the, the, the probabilities, the transition probabilities are anyway uh, retrieved from somewhere and you cannot possibly trust them completely. So maybe a pack is enough. And the general question is how far we want to compromise because on the one side we have uh, I mean, this hot area of machine learning that is, uh, that is uh, really amazing, but uh, I mean, our guaranteed techniques are pretty cool. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>